this is Bill Frank for KADY TV. I'm here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, where we're about to see one of our great national treasures. NASA has an exhibit that they are taking around the country, exhibiting the moon rocks that they brought back from the various Apollo missions. That's why I'm standing here next to this spacesuit, one of the original Apollo type spacesuits that are here. We're going to go inside, take a look at these moon rocks, hear a little bit of the history behind them, certainly learn more about the Apollo program itself, and talk a bit about the future of NASA and the future of our space program. In addition to that, we'll also be taking a look at some of the other paraphernalia that NASA has brought here to show us from the various moon projects. One of the more interesting parts of the NASA exhibit are the little pieces of paraphernalia that they had in the space program. And you see on my left hand, I actually have two of those pieces. I am holding a tray, which is truly a space tray, with dehydrated food, that it, the kind that is used in space, and I'm holding it with the type of glove that an astronaut would be wearing in space. I can tell you that the glove is very warm, very uncomfortable though, when you try to pick up things of small size, like a, a quarter or something that requires precise uh, uh, picking up with your hand. The dehydrated food is interesting on a number of different levels. First of all, you can see each of the types of food here in its pack. In order to rehydrate it, there's an actual hypodermic needle that gets inserted into the top where you see the nipple on the, on the food package itself. Warm water is injected in there, it's shaken up a little bit, and the rehydrated food is essentially cooked. Now, each of these packages is affixed to the tray by a Velcro strip. And when you think about it, that's very important because in space where there's zero gravity, you don't want your food floating away. Likewise, if you take a look at the bottom of the tray, you can see there's a Velcro strip there for affixing the tray itself to your lap so that the tray and the food don't go floating away in space. These are the types of pieces that we have on exhibit here with the Moon Rock exhibit at the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley. And I'm joined by Jenny Knotts, who is the Public Affairs Officer for NASA, who's in charge of this display that's here exhibiting the moon rocks and several other pieces of interesting space paraphernalia. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about this exhibit that we are in right now. What are we about to see, and what message are you trying to convey to the people that come to the exhibit? Uh, the big message is NASA's still open. <laughs> We're still open for business. We've retired the shuttle. But we've still got a lot of exploring to do, so that's pretty much what this trailer is going to tell you. It'll take you through what we're currently doing now with Space Station, and it'll take you into our future explorations and where we want to go and how we want to get there. All right, well, one of the highlights that's here are it really a piece of our national treasure, and those are moon rocks that were brought back from the Apollo missions, which is now part of our history. I want to turn our attention before we go to the moon rocks to the future, if I can. Let's talk about what NASA has in store for space exploration. First of all, you were outlining before where there's a progression that we're going to move through as we explore space, and then we'll take a look at some of the different vehicles that are going to get us there. Well, right now we're trying to figure out exactly what our goal is, where we want to land, pardon the pun, um, and our next mission. We've done low Earth orbit, uh, we'd like to expand beyond that, so we're looking at either the Moon, Mars, an asteroid, or a Lagrange point is where our focus is at this point. And for those of us that are space challenged, what is Lagrange point? I know you're going to ask me that. I'm a little science challenged myself. It's actually a point between the uh, moon and the earth where the gravitational pull is negligible. So if you put something there, it's going to stay there. Right now, we've got space station, which is an earth's gravitational pull. We have to fire thrusters to keep it in its orbit. But if you put something at Lagrange point, it's not going to leave that. Fascinating. All right, Jenny, now to get us there is going to require a completely different type of vehicle because, as you said, the space shuttle has been retired. If we take a look behind you, this is a diagram of the next generation capsule that's going into space. Walk us through this. What are we looking at? Well, you're looking at an artist's conception of what the um, Orion capsule is going to look like. We actually have built test articles, but this part right here is where the astronauts will be, and that's what's going to come back to Earth. You've got your engine to get you out of low Earth orbit, and right here you're looking at the launch abort system. I see. Now, how many astronauts can fit inside of Orion's capsule? You can put four to seven inside Orion's capsule, depending on how far you're going to go and how much, uh, how many supplies you're going to need. Is that depending on whether there's first class or it's all coach? <laughs> I think they're all kind of coach at this point because there's not a lot of leg room. I see. Now, besides the emergency system that we see pictured here, which is the largest part of the, the capsule unit itself, I noticed that there are two solar arrays. Talk to us about how solar power is going to enter into propelling our next capsules into space. Well, solar power is going to play a big part. If you don't, can't send enough fuel uh, and you don't want to use your energized batteries, 
Um, so solar power is what we're going to do. We're perfecting it with the space station. It's all run on solar power, so we're able to um, conserve power when we're not using it or for when the um, arrays aren't facing the sun. So we're going to use that technology on Orion and give it a longer life so we can get to that two to three year mission to Mars. Fascinating. Now, to actually propel the capsule into space, it's going to take a different type of rocket, something that's different than we use for the space shuttle to propel that into space, and certainly something that is different from the old Saturn V's that launched the Apollo capsules. Talk to us about the next generation of rocket that we see right over here. Uh, the one we're looking at here, again, is an artist's conception. We're right now working on the architecture for it. You're right, though, it's going to take a much bigger uh, rocket than it did to get the shuttle on board and actually to be, well, from what I hear at this point, slightly larger than the, uh, um, slightly larger okay. than what the uh, Saturn V is going to be. But you we're going to combine pieces of each. So you've got solid rocket boosters on the side. So you've got what looks like the Saturn V. We're using the J2X okay, engine so on the Saturn V. Okay, and then on top of that is where you'll have your capsule. I see. Now, we're using the solid rocket boosters, and of course everyone remembers the disasters that we've had launching the space shuttle uh, down in, at Cape Kennedy. Talk to us about the difference between these solid rocket boosters and the rocket boosters that were used for the space shuttle. Well, we did safety's number one at NASA, so after the disaster of the Challenger, we did a lot of research and a lot of uh, looking into what went wrong, what we need to do to prevent it, so we learned about cold and how that affects the O-rings. So all of that has gone into these designs. The other difference is when you were in shuttle, you had the shuttle strapped to the rocket. At this, at this point, you'll have it on top. So should something go wrong with one of the solid rocket boosters all the way on the bottom, that launch abort system will take the astronauts away. And that's an important differentiation. Shuttle did not have a launch abort system. Did exactly. It? it did not. There was no way to disengage. Well, Jenny, you're here at the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley. I don't know if you knew this or not, but here in Simi Valley, Rocketdyne actually tested the rockets, uh, the engines, for the old Saturn V. And that work was done not very far from where you are right now. I did not know that. Well, there you go. But as we look into space and we're going farther and deeper into space, it's going to take not only human intervention, but it's also going to take mechanical intervention as mm -hmm. well. And one of the more fascinating scientific, science, science fiction portions of this is taking a look at the robotics that go into it. And you've got some fascinating detail over here about the next generation of robot that it will be accompanying us into space. Tell us about this. We do. This is Robonaut. He is our uh, sixth or seventh crew member on Space Station. He's currently up there now. He's a humanoid robot with fully articulated hands and wrist and elbow and shoulder joints. Um, so he can feel things in his fingers. And uh, last week we fired him up and let him start flipping switches. What we'll have him do for now is help out inside space station with experiments, housekeeping, but eventually we'd like to send him outside and have him do spacewalks instead of the humans. Well, Jenny, one of the questions that I had for you earlier is why do these robots have a humanoid factor? I mean, after all, they're robots. We really don't need them to look like human beings. And you actually had a very cogent argument for that. What was it? Well, everything we've got up in space is built for human hands and built for humans to interact with. So in order to make the robots as effective as possible, we need to model them after ourselves. Wow, that is great. So that's the future of NASA, Jenny. Now I'd like you to take us back into the history of NASA. I really want to look at the crown jewel of your exhibit here, and that is the moon rock. We'll talk about that and talk about what they mean to our American culture in just a minute. Coming to the absolute pièce de résistance of the exhibit from NASA here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, I'm joined by Jenny Knott. So Jenny, tell us, we have brought back countless rocks from the moon for scientific exploration. You have one of them on display here. Tell us a little bit about this particular rock, from which moon mission did it come, why is it significant, why are we seeing it here on exhibit today? This particular piece actually came from Apollo 17. December 1972, that was our last uh, steps on the moon. This one is significant. It's closest to a lava rock you find in Hawaii. There are a few chemical differences that I couldn't pronounce to save my life. Um, but it's a lot, very close to those lava rocks. We have it as a touchstone because it's so hard, it's able to withstand the uh, rubbing, constant rubbing that it, would get, that it gets. And as I look at it, it is open to the public, so I'm actually going to put my finger on it right now. And I will tell you, the surface of it is very smooth highly polished. I wonder if that's from all of the human fingers touching it with all the oil. And it really looks like a machine tooled stone. Very interesting piece of moon rock there. The rocks that we brought back from the moon, first of all, how many rocks did we bring back in total? Give, not the number, but give me the poundage that we actually brought back. And what scientific research has this enabled us to do? 
Well, we brought back 842 pounds total, so we only have one or two floating around Johnson Space Center. Um, and we're actually still doing research on it today, and it allows us to find out what chemical composition it has, um, how it's, the span of the moon has affected the rocks, and a lot of what we learned is they're very, very close to Earth rocks. We think the moon might actually have been part of Earth four billion years ago, and uh, so some of what we're discovering is our history as this planet. That's very interesting. Only 842 pounds of rocks total across six different missions. For people who are maybe not familiar with the space flights and the lunar excursion module that had to escape the moon's gravity in order to join up with the space capsule, why is it we were limited in the amount of rocks that we could bring back? Uh, if we put too, much, too many rocks on there, we couldn't lift off and actually come back. And for some reason, those guys wanted to come back to Earth. Um, so we were limited to about 300 pounds per mission. 300 pounds per mission. And this is just one of those missions. Fascinating exhibit that you have here. It's a fascinating piece of our American heritage. I guess the next question is, the biggest challenge for NASA is exciting the American people about space exploration again. Those of us who grew up in the 60s, we remember that. We remember the fever that was behind it. We've got two, maybe three generations now that have come along since then that don't ex share that same enthusiasm. What is it going to take to excite the American population to get excited about going back to space? That's a really good question and one we're trying to figure out the answer to. So if anybody has any ideas, um, no, it's just, it's going to take educating the public. We've got space station up there now. Uh, it's not as cool, some say, as the shuttle because you don't get the big boom and the big explosion. But what they're doing up there is pretty neat and all the human research. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of people say that jobs up in space, you know, we've got problems down here. Well, the jobs aren't in space. They're down here on Earth. So everybody who works on a shuttle mission or a station mission or works at NASA, those jobs are here on Earth. Um, and what we're learning is going to benefit life here on Earth. Fascinating. Jenny, thank you so much for being our guest here on KD. I'm Bill Frank, reporting for KADY-TV from the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, where the NASA Moon Rock exhibit will be on display for the next few days.